Hi everyone, it's Ed, uh, and this is module three for Introduction to Sociology. Uh, this module is going to be rather lengthy, or the PowerPoint is rather, uh, so therefore I'm going to record three separate videos. In the first video, I'm going to be talking about life in groups. In the second video, I'm going to be talking about deviant behavior. And in the third video, I'm going to be talking about social stratification or social inequality. Let's go ahead and get started with life in groups. Just wanted to uh, let you know the difference between a group and a crowd, because you are going to see this on your exam. A lot of people use the words uh, group and crowd interchangeably, but to a sociologist, they are very different. Let me explain that a crowd is simply a uh, mass of people that are in the same place at the same time. They don't necessarily uh, have any meaningful interaction with one another. For example, if you're looking at people that are standing in line, particularly like long lines in grocery stores or Walmarts, uh, you would definitely find that to be a crowd. Uh, you don't know the people in line with you and well, you don't really want to. I will, I will mention, however, that in crowds large enough, such as, you know, 20, 25,000 people at a rock concert, uh, you could have groups of people uh, making up that crowd. Uh, the fact of the matter is that in a group, you are talking about people who have a meaningful affiliation with one another. They are uh, familiar with one another to some degree, and they uh, identify as members of that group. Now, uh, I wanna mention here two types of groups that are very important, and you'll see these also on your exam. A primary group are the group of people that you uh, affiliate with, that you are affiliated with, that are the most important to you. Uh, primarily, we are thinking about family and close friends. In a primary group, uh, it is that the bonds are stronger and they last longer. Ought to work for Hallmark, shouldn't I, right? The bonds are stronger and they last longer. Yeah, that's the primary group. Um, and I know people have said to me, well, Ed, you know, my family and I, we don't particularly get along all that well. Uh, does that mean that we are no longer uh, in the same primary group? And my answer is absolutely not simply because you do not get along with someone in a primary group, your family, or simply because you do not. Um, I don't know, acknowledge those bonds does not mean that they do not exist. So be aware of that. Those bonds exist in primary groups, whether you choose to accept them or not. Then there are secondary groups. Secondary groups, this is very simple. Secondary groups are any groups that are not primary. When we think of secondary groups, we're thinking primarily of workplace associates, and we're thinking of uh, you know, school, uh, bowling teams, if you're on the bowling team like I was, uh, these are secondary groups. The bonds are not as strong and they are more temporary. They do not last as long. Um, so the fact of the matter is, if you looked at this class as a secondary group, uh, you might, you might, and you might, you might do that, but know that the bonds are not as strong. And at the end of the semester, uh, these bonds are going to be terminated and we will no longer be a group. So since we're talking about groups, I thought I should mention that the fewest number of people you need to have a group is two. We call two people in a group a dyad or couple. I mean, you know, it is what it is. But a dyad is the sociological term. Um, and a dyad has a very unique group dynamic in the fact that if one person wishes to terminate the group, uh, that's all it takes. One person can walk away and it's no longer a group. However, as you add more people and you add say a third person you become a, the group becomes a triad and as the group becomes a triad uh, that shifts the balance of group dynamics a little bit meaning that it can turn very easily into a two-on-one situation and if one person decides to leave the group does not terminate as it does in a dyad and i also would like to mention here that it is very very important to realize that you can have as many people in a group as, as you wish, as wish to join the group. 
The problem is that as the group gets bigger with larger numbers, we see the opportunity for uh, in groups or cliques and in fighting. And sooner or later with this in fighting, uh, different cliques or subsets in the group itself may move on to do their own thing. So the group membership and the group dynamics, guys, just be aware that it's very, very, very complicated, uh, whether you are dealing with two people or multitudes of people in a group. Part of a group uh, that you need to be aware of, especially at this point in your life, here in college, uh, your social networks. I know that a lot of people are aware of social networks through Facebook or through LinkedIn, uh, but social networking is not just limited to the internet. Social networking is, um, it's geared more towards the internet these days, seemingly, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. I will tell you that a lot of jobs are earned or uh, uh, employers will hire people based on social networking, word of mouth, uh, particularly if their uh, endorsement is coming from a trusted source. And it makes sense. Um, so be very careful what you put out there on, on the internet, if I haven't mentioned that before already, uh, because now is the time for you to start developing your social networks for your careers. Um, be aware of that. Also be aware of virtual communities such as this course. This course is conducted through a virtual community. Uh, technology, the internet, uh, PowerPoints and Zoom are allowing me to lecture to you and hopefully allowing you to learn what I have to say. Uh, be aware that virtual communities allow, allow people to do nearly everything that they can do face to face. I mean, you can hang out, you can listen to music, play video games, converse with one another. Uh, just be aware that that is, that is the world we live in. I know that many of my students have heard me talk before and have heard me say that I've had students uh, taking my classes in South Korea and in the Middle East and in Europe even. Um, and that's amazing that we can all do this uh, and all meet virtually without having to leave uh, our home area. Um, so just be aware of just be aware of those things with the virtual community. If we're talking about other things dealing with groups, reference groups are very important to us because reference groups are how we uh, begin to view ourselves. We identify with these reference groups. So these, these are the people that we identify with. And I'll say right now, and I probably should not say this, but I'll say it anyway. Uh, right now at my stage in life, my reference group is people over the age of 40. And in a few years, it's going to be over the age of 50. People my age are my reference group. I'm not one of those people that goes, well, back in my day, but I will say this, at least back in my day, we know we didn't do that Tide Pod Challenge. Just wanna throw that out there. No offense to anybody, but I'm saying reference group, I identify with people over the age of 40. There are, other two there are two other types of groups you need to be familiar with for your exam, an in-group and an out-group. In-groups are people that we instinctively like. We are attracted to them. We gravitate towards them. We have warm feelings towards them. Uh, out-groups are the exact opposite. Out-groups are people that we dislike and we try to avoid. Um, it's sort of like being in with the, I don't want to say in crowd because that might get you confused, being in with the in-group and being on the outs with someone when you're talking about an in-group and an out-group. I should also mention that there's absolutely nothing wrong with in-groups and out-groups in and of themselves. Um, I mean, naturally it's human nature that we gravitate towards people that we like and you know, kind of shy away from people that we don't. But the fact of the matter is when people take things too far and they go to the extreme, uh, this in-group and out-group can turn into an us against them type situation. And that is uh, the cause for many of the problems in our world. We'll talk more about that when we talk about race and ethnicity and sex and gender in this course. Every group has to have a leader. And there are two types of leaders that are out there. 
uh, in addition to the leadership styles that we're going to talk about on the next slide, the type of leader types you need to be familiar with are instrumental and expressive. Instrumental leaders focus on getting the job done above all else. They do not particularly care about the well-being of their uh, subordinates in the group. As long as the job gets done, they're happy. Expressive leaders, on the other hand, are more focused on uh, making sure that the uh, subordinates are taken care of because they realize that in many instances, a happy and content group of subordinates are able to get the job done better than uh, disgruntled employee or disgruntled subordinates. The fact of the matter is instrumental and expressive leaders are just, it's not saying that one is better than the other, it's just describing the leadership styles. And I should also like to point out, and we will discuss this when we talk about sex and gender, that in many instances, if instrumental leaders or expressive leaders are not uh, leaders who are following prescribed gender roles, uh, there's going to be a lot of blowback for that. And again, we'll talk more about that when we talk about sex and gender. Uh, just be aware to stay tuned. Um, there are three leadership styles in um, that we need to be familiar with, the authoritarian style, the democratic style, the laissez-faire style. And again, this is like a spectrum. On one end of the spectrum, you have the authoritarian style where the leader um, is the ultimate authority and uh, does not appreciate questioning, does not appreciate um, people that are trying to do their own thing, trying to express their individuality. Uh, the authoritarian style is very much iron fist and you do it their way or it's wrong. The democratic style, on the other hand, is a leader who is sort of in the middle of the road. Uh, they do have uh, the um, they do they do wish to serve as a guide almost, um, but they are not so uh, they are not so set in their ways that they cannot allow for people to do things their own way. To, for the subordinates to do things their own way. The democratic style is very much uh, willing to listen. They sort of have an open door policy and they serve often as a uh, more of a resource or a guide than a uh, totalitarian down your throat, uh, screaming, yelling in your face boss. And the last style is the laissez-faire style. The laissez-faire style, laissez-faire means hands-off. Basically, they take a hands-off approach to leadership. Um, they just sort of point you in the right direction and expect you to do, uh, do the job without them even, I don't know, serving as a point of reference. Um, and I will mention that my type of leadership style that I like may not necessarily be the type of leadership style that you like. When I first started teaching this class, I thought, well, who in the world would like an authoritarian type leader? Who in the world would like that style? What I found is there are plenty of people that do because according to them, according to my students, things get done. Things get done with the authoritarian style. Uh, things get done with the democratic style. Uh, things don't get done as much or as well uh, with the laissez-faire style. Uh, for me, like I said, I'm more of a democratic style person and I respond a lot better to that type of leadership. Although I know that many students do like the authoritarian style. Just throwing that out there. If we're talking about groups, we also need to talk about groupthink. Groupthink is the extreme pressure to conform to the expectations of the group. You're not allowed to express individuality. You're not allowed to dress differently, speak differently, think differently, act differently, or did I say dress differently? Uh, you're not. They don't allow for individuality. It's it's an extreme pressure to conform, and if you fail to conform, uh, there are going to be consequences. Now. When I think of groupthink, I think automatically of George Carlin. George Carlin was one of my heroes. Um, and he's done, a, done and said a lot of things that make a lot of sense to me. Uh, one of the things he was talking about was school uniforms. He says, uh, don't the schools do enough damage making the kids look alike now, or try to make them think alike. Now they're trying to make them look alike as well. It's not anything new 
It's been going on in the, since the 1930s. I saw it on newsreels, uh, but I had trouble understanding it because the narration was in German. Now, if there's anybody that's hearing this video that does not understand what George Carlin was trying to say, please let me know and I will explain it to you as gently as I can. And this is something else I've had disagreements with on students about. I would absolutely hate having to wear a school uniform. But conversely, strangely enough, there are some students who actually like the idea of a school uniform. And they have, a diff they have their different reasons, and I can respect that. But me personally, I don't like people trying to take away my individuality. And that's what groupthink is all about. It's taking away individuality to the point where you are conforming because you are under such pressure. Because if you don't conform, you are going to experience consequences. And let me tell you, some of the consequences are pretty severe. Depending on the group members that you are associated with, uh, this, these consequences could include physical abuse up to and including death. So if we're talking about conformity and groupthink, I recommend you be like this goldfish and do not conform. I recommend that you also learn about these three experiments, which I'm going to explain very briefly. The Ash experiment, the Milgram experiment, and the Stanford prison experiment. You will see these on your exam. The Ash experiment was conducted 50, 60 years ago, give or take. Uh, Solomon Ash wanted to know if individuals would conform uh, to group pressure despite uh, seeing the truth before their own eyes. And it was very disheartening to find out that people would uh, conform to group pressure. Uh, in fact, it was very disheartening to find out that there were two reasons people would conform. First of all, they didn't want to stand out. They didn't want to cause problems. They didn't want to make waves. Second of all, because they actually started to second guess themselves, even seeing for themselves that uh, the line on the left is most uh, closest in length to line B here, there are people that would actually second guess themselves if they heard other members of a group saying that it was A or C or something along those lines. Forgive the expression. The fact of the matter is, I recommend this, do not conform. Do not conform to peer pressure. Do not conform. If you know something is right and something is wrong, stick to your guns, even if you have to stand alone. The Milgram experiment was conducted by Stanley Milgram. He was conducting research to determine why uh, the travesties of World War II took place. He was conducting the research and he wanted to know why someone would harm another person that he or she did not know. And what he found was very surprising to me. He found that about 60 to 65 percent of the people would go all the way to the point of actually killing someone without blinking. Oh, I say without blinking an eye. They would do it. Uh, stop and go, stop and go. Uh, and the problem is that as long as they could shed responsibility, and as long as someone else, they felt someone else was in charge, was telling them what to do, and they were just following orders, they would do that. The just following orders excuse is uh, what the Nazis that we tried during Nuremberg is what they said. We were just following orders. Well, the fact of the matter is we said that's not good enough. And we actually executed a bunch of those Nazis. And we put the rest of them in prison for a very long time. Because just following orders when it's causing harm to someone else is not good enough. And we need to be better than that. But Milgram found out that there are a lot of people who will go all the way. Also, wanted to mention this now, uh, while I still have it fresh in my mind, if you look, I've included short little video clips for you uh, that detail the Ash experiment, the Milgram experiment, as well as the Stanford prison experiment. 
Um, I also, since we're talking about the Stanford prison experiment, I should mention that uh, Philip Zimbardo is not exactly, not exactly one of my favorite people uh, because he caused a lot of psychological terror in the uh, psychology department's basement in Stanford University when he conducted this experiment. But what was interesting to find out was how deeply involved um, these college students would get when they were uh, acting out the roles, either as prison guards or prisoners. And if you watch the video here, it's almost disheartening to hear uh, that this experiment was supposed to go on for 14 days, but was stopped after less than a week. And it was stopped because of the psychological trauma that these college students were experiencing. Um, he wanted to know, Zimbardo, wanted to know why uh, there was so much brutality in prisons. He wanted to know if the guards themselves were just naturally broody, brutally people, brutal people, or if these guards were conforming to the expected roles uh, that were not held in check, held in place by authority figures running the prison. Uh, still, what he found was very disheartening, and it's very disturbing, and I'm very glad that an experiment like that could never be done again. I also want to mention teamwork, because if we're talking about groups, we have to talk about teamwork and this thing called social loafing. How many people that are watching this video, and you don't have to, I mean, you can't obviously answer me, but how many people in here actually like working in groups for school? Well, the fact of the matter is, if you like working groups for school, you can find it somewhere else. I'm not going to assign group projects in this course because of social loafing. Let me explain to you what social loafing means. Social loafing means that the more people that are involved in a project, the less likely it is that everybody is going to pull their weight, that the less likely it is that everybody is going to do an equal amount of work. Generally, it's going to be one or two people who are pulling the pulling the load and the rest are just getting the credit. Now, I don't know about you, but when I die, I want to be I want the people that I was in teams with in school to be my pallbearers because I want them to let me down one last time. Yeah, I was the guy pulling the team. I was the one pulling the load. And I'm sure that if you're watching this, you probably were too. But the fact of the matter is social loafing is a real phenomenon. It's more like shrugging off the responsibility and going, the work will get done. Doesn't matter if I, if I do something or if I don't do uh, my share as long as it gets done. And the bigger the group, the more likely it is that that's going to happen. So that's why I don't assign group work in this class, folks, and I'm sure many of you are very happy about that. I also want to talk about bureaucracies. Bureaucracies are, um, they're, they're denoted by uh, a series of, of things, including uh, uh, written communication, a uh, chain of command. I'm not going to quiz you on a bureaucracy, so just know this. But the one thing about a bureaucracy that I want you to understand is the impersonality. You are not really a person with feelings in a bureaucracy because their goal is to make money. Their goal is to be efficient. They don't care about you. They don't care about me, okay? Their goal is to become as efficient as possible and make as much money as possible. And if I can use this example, and I'm sure that some of the older students will appreciate this, when we think of a bureaucracy, think of the Pink Floyd song, because all in all, you're just another brick in the wall, okay? Now, I want you to understand about bureaucracy, there's nothing wrong with it, but it, it really, you are replaceable, okay? Um, you are, and in any, in any job, we are all replaceable, including me. Every job that I've ever had, I've been replaceable, including this one. And I'm telling you now that no matter who you work for uh, or whatever you do, you can be replaced. They can find someone else to do what you do. They can find someone else to do what I do. Because the rationalization of bureaucracy, it means that they are focused on efficiency and they are focused on making money. 
Last but not least, if we're explaining groups, and I tend to agree with Albert Einstein, if you can't explain something simply, you just don't understand it well enough. That's why I'm teaching. The, the way we explain the groups through the sociological perspectives, we refer to, first of all, the micro level of symbolic interaction. And we say that groups are the means through, through which uh, individuals learn the expectations of society. They socialize us. They serve as social agents of socialization, our families, our friends, schools, the media, and so on and so forth. The macro level of structural functionalism says that societies are made up of different groups. And th while these different groups do conflict from time to time, for the most part, the, the groups do uh, str strive to maintain equilibrium. Um, everything here in, in our society is, at least according to the functionalist, focused on cohesion rather than coercion. Now, the conflict perspective says that depending on which groups you belong to, uh, you are going to have better life chances. Uh, the structural functionalists, getting back to them for just a second, they tend to believe that uh, when we talk about groups, these groups all have uh, some degree of power in, in, a, in a society. The conflict perspective, the conflict theorists feel the opposite. The conflict perspective don't believe in co co cohesion, there we go, they believe in coercion. In other words, the uh, groups that have the most money and the greatest resources are going to have the better life chances. And we'll talk more about that as we talk about stratification, as we talk about race and ethnicity, as we talk about sex and gender and politics in this, in this, uh, in this course. So guys, that's all I have. If you have any questions or concerns, please reach out to me and I'll see you online. Have a good one.